Section 4 of Favorite Fairy Tales Retold. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Libby Marie Lennon. Favorite Fairy Tales Retold by Julia Darrow Cowles. Inger's Loaf. Once upon a time, a little peasant girl named Inger was sent to the home of a rich family in the country to act as serving maid. Now Inger was a very pretty girl, but she was proud and selfish, and this had caused her father and mother a great deal of sorrow. The rich people to whom she was sent were good to little Inger. They dressed her as prettily as they did their own little daughter, and they treated her as kindly as though she too were their own. One would think that this would have caused Inger to be kind and loving, but instead she became more and more proud and selfish. One day, when she had been away from her home many months, her employer said to her, "'Inger, it is quite time that you visited your father and mother.' So Inger put on her very best shoes and her prettiest dress, and away she started. "'It will be surprised to see how grand I look,' she said to herself as she ran along. When she reached the edge of the village, she saw groups of young men and women walking about and talking, and seated upon a rough stone bench she saw her own mother. On her mother's back rested a bundle of sticks which she had picked up for fuel. What will all those people say to see me talking to an old woman with a bundle of sticks on her back? exclaimed Inger, looking at her own pretty clothes. So without speaking one word to her mother, she turned and ran back to her employer in the country. Many months passed, and then her employer said again, "'Little Inger, it is time you visited your father and mother.' So once more, Inger put on her very best shoes and her prettiest dress, and just as she was about to start, her employer handed her a fine fresh loaf of wheat and bread. "'It is for your father and mother,' she said. "'They will like the fresh sweet loaf.' Now the peasants lived on coarse oat cakes, and fresh wheat and bread was a very great treat. So Inger took the loaf and started on her way. Presently she came to a spot where the ground was soft and wet. Inger stopped and looked down. "'I shall spoil my pretty shoes if I step in the marsh,' she said to herself. "'I want to look fine when I reach the village. I know what I will do. I will drop this loaf in the marsh and jump upon it. Then I shall keep my shoes quite clean.' "'But your father and mother would like the wheat and bread,' a voice seemed to say. It will be a rare treat to them, and they oftentimes have to go hungry, you know. Inger looked at the loaf, then she looked at the marsh, and last of all she looked at her shoes. I cannot help that, she said. I must save my pretty shoes. With that, she threw the loaf into the marsh and sprang upon it. But when she would have leapt from the loaf to the opposite side of the marsh, she could not. Her feet were held fast by the loaf and in a moment it sank out of sight and pulled little Inger down with it. And where do you suppose Inger found herself? She found herself in the home of the old Marsh Wife, who was half-sister to the Elf King. Now the Marsh Wife and the Elf King live quite close to Bogeyland, and all sorts of queer things happen in that part of the world. But poor Inger was in a sad plight for visiting strange countries. The mud of the marsh had soiled her pretty shoes, her fine dress, and even her face and her hair. "'What a dirty-looking child!' exclaimed an old woman, who sat in the marshwife's kitchen. Inger gazed at the old woman, and she did not like her. The old woman was working very fast at the strangest piece of embroidery, was made entirely of lies, which she wove with rapid fingers. By her side were piled a heap of necklaces. These were made from idle words, which she had picked up and strung together. She loved to give these necklaces away, for they always caused the wearers no end of trouble. On the other side of the old woman lay a pile of slippers. She had made them from gadabout leather, and these, too, she loved to give away, for the wearers of them could find no rest. Indeed, she was a very wicked old woman, and Inger began to tremble as she looked at her. Presently the old woman put down her embroidery and looked at Inger through a pair of very big eyeglasses. It seemed to Inger that with those eyeglasses the old woman could see right into her heart. Yes, said the old woman at last. She will make a good statue for my court. May I have her? 
"'You are quite welcome to her,' replied the marsh wife. "'I do not know why she came here. "'What is it that she stands upon?' "'It looks like a wheaten loaf,' said the old woman. "'And she was quite right, "'for Inger's feet were still fast to the loaf, "'and neither one of them could she move. "'A statue?' said Inger to herself. "'Statues are beautiful. "'I suppose she wants me because I am pretty.' But no sooner had she thought this than she remembered that she was covered with mud and that the old woman had called her a dirty child. But she had no more time in which to wonder, for the old woman had already gathered up her work and was whisking her away to Bogeyland, for that was where the old woman lived. The next that Inger knew, she was standing, still on her wheaten loaf, in a great court among many other statues, for she was now a statue herself. She could think, and she could turn her eyes and look about, but aside from this, she was as stiff as a stone. The statues about her were not pretty, but they were quite as pretty as poor Inger in her covering of brown mud. Now Inger had plenty of time to think, for she could not run about or talk or play. She could only stand in the old woman's court in Bogeyland. At first, she thought only about herself, and of how unhappy she was but she could not shed a tear, no matter how wretched she felt. She watched the old woman at her work, and she thought of all the unhappiness and trouble she was making for other people. She saw her fashioning her gifts, embroideries of lies and necklaces of idle words and slippers of gadabout leather, and she thought what a wicked woman she was. Then she wondered how all the other statues came to be in the old woman's garden, and if they were as unhappy as she but after a while, Inger did not give so much time to these unpleasant thoughts. She began to think instead about her father and mother and her kind employer. She remembered how good they had always been to her. Then she remembered how she had turned away from her mother when she had a bundle of sticks upon her back, and how she had thrown the wheat and loaf into the marsh when her father and mother had perhaps been hungry. All at once, she exclaimed within herself, "'Why, I am just as bad as this old woman!' I was so vain and selfish that I made everyone else unhappy, for I tried only to please myself. The more Inger thought about this, the sorrier she grew, and at last she said, Oh, if I could only give so much as a wheaten loaf to someone, how happy I should be! Then something very strange happened. The stiff statue which had been Inger seemed all at once to melt, and away from it there flew a sober little brown bird and the bird winged its way to the upper air. It was a very quiet, timid little bird, and it could not sing, but it crept into a crevice in a wall and watched the other birds about it. It was winter, and the waters were frozen, and the fields were covered with snow, so the birds could find but little to eat. But on Christmas Day, our little brown bird saw the people of the village tie a sheaf of grain to a pole. Then they raised the pole upright and went away and left it. And oh, how the birds flocked around and ate the grain, for that was just what the people had wished. The little brown bird hopped out with the rest and ate a kernel of wheat. Then a happy thought came to it, and away it flew. It flew along the roads, where loads of grain had jolted. It lighted outside kitchen windows where crumbs were thrown, and everywhere that it went it ate just one kernel or one crumb, and it called the other birds to come and take all the rest. Here and there the little brown bird flew, hunting for food and calling the other birds whenever it found a bit to eat. It was a very happy bird. Its only sorrow was that it could not sing. But one day, when it had divided a single crumb with a tiny wren, the little brown bird heard a voice say, Little brown bird, you have given away enough crumbs and seeds to make a whole wheat and loaf. At that, the little brown bird felt something throbbing in its throat, and the next moment it was pouring forth a beautiful song of thanksgiving, a song so sweet and pure and clear that the children playing in a nearby yard stopped to listen. And as they looked, the bird lifted its wings, and it was all pure white, and it flew happily away into the sky. End of section 4